Hello and welcome to today's webinar on EFTCP Installation Energy Funding Opportunities. My name is Stephanie Lawless and I will be moderating today's session. We will get started in a few moments. While we wait for others to log on, I would like to cover a few logistical items. Today's broadcast will be listen only. We will have a question and answer period at the end of the presentation. You may submit questions by using the chat box on the left-hand portion of the screen. You do not need to wait until the Q&A period to submit your questions. In fact, we encourage you to submit them in advance of that session. The phone lines will remain listen only throughout the presentation, so we will not be taking any questions verbally. You will not be able to answer questions about specific proposal ideas or technologies during this webinar. Please note that both the audio and the presentation of today's session will be archived on our solicitation webpage in case you would like to refer to them in the future. Today's speakers are Dr. Herb Nelson, the Director of ESTCP, and Mr. Tim Tatro, the ESTCP Energy and Water Program Manager. Before I turn it over to Herb and Tim, I would like to remind phone participants that this is a listen-only session, and to submit questions, please use the chat box in the left-hand portion of the screen. Herb? Thank you very much, Stephanie, and I would like to uh, welcome you all to the uh, 2018 uh, Funding Opportunities Webinar for Energy and Water Technologies in ESTCP. So as many of you know, we are actually two programs managed from the same program office. The Strategic Environmental Research and Development Program on your left is our Science and Technology Program, and then we're dis the uh, topic of today's discussion, the Environmental Security Technology Certification Program, which is in DOD words a demonstration validation program, is on your right. We uh, divide ourselves into five program areas. The subject of today's uh, webinar is the Energy and Water Program area, which you see on the top. Earlier, about a month ago, we had the funding area for our environmental topics, which comprise weapon systems and platforms, environmental restoration, resource conservation and resiliency, and munitions response. So I'm going to give a little introduction both to the program, which I just did, and to how this whole uh, process works, and then I'll turn it over to Tim to talk in detail about some of the issues and, and what we're looking for in the energy and water program area. ESCCP projects, I said earlier, are demonstration, demonstration, excuse me, validation projects. And you can see from these bullets, they're really meant to demonstrate innovative and cost-effective environmental, and in most cases, and in insulation energy, in this case, technologies. We, are real, they, we really look at them as a way to transition technology out of the lab. And we, we put a big focus on the second large bullet. We really focus these things to promote implementation. So we'd like to see insertion directly into a DOD facility. We want to gain regulatory and end user acceptance. And of course, since we are a DOD program, we, our priority is always the needs of the DOD user community. So you see up here the hallmarks of what we're looking for in a technology to be demonstrated in the ESTCP. Keeping in mind that this is really a program to take things to sort of bridge the gap between laboratory and brass board type demonstrations and real DOD use. So we're looking for technologies that can benefit from a demonstration or DOD installation. We may have a technology that is worked under a certain set of conditions. We need to know whether we, we can work it at a DOD base. It might have a different uh, energy demand profile or a different supply profile. So we might have to tune up some of our parameters for the DOD, and that's the kind of thing that would be appropriate for ESDCP. We definitely, if we're not able to currently uh, write down a real cost and a real benefit, we have good ideas, but we don't have hard numbers, that might be a reason there would be an ESDCP demonstration. And then, of course, the last small bullet, we definitely want to use the information from the ESDCP demonstration to facilitate commercialization and broader adoption, both in DOD and across the country. To keep in mind, though, the second large bullet, this is not we're not trying to solve the energy problems of any individual DOD installation. So a mature commercial technology that's already in use or that's ready to go at a particular site are not, is not appropriate uh, technology for demonstration and validation. So you see our uh, overall methodology here. We always seek to partner with stakeholders. We do our test at DOD facilities. We want to involve, just as I've said several times, we're looking to uh, facilitate end user acceptance. So we want to involve developers of the technology, regulators if it's appropriate, end users, and that can lead to direct transition. We're looking to gather cost and performance data. 
So we often have independent test and evaluation. Many of the PIs will structure their proposals to have a third-party uh, test and evaluation involved, or we may provide that ourselves. And of course, we need to satisfy the end user community. That's really a repeat of the first big bullet. And we're seeking always to see DOD market opportunities. How well will this technology work across the DOD or across, across some significant subset of the DOD, not just in an individual base? So here is how we run these programs. They, this is very much a science and technology program, so it's not sort of get good pictures and fancy graphics and we're out of there. We uh, require formal demonstration plans, and the demonstration plans are heavy on what we expect to measure, what we expect to find when we measure it, what are the hard criteria or criterion or criteria for uh, success. So that's the detailed performance objectives and then the possibility of independent review. We then, after the uh, de uh, demonstration plan is approved, we would do the execution of the demonstration on the, on the base or base as where we will be collecting careful cost and performance data. And then finally, there will be a final report, a technical report, and a shorter, almost executive summary level cost and performance report that would be accessible to all potential users of the technology. And then of course, we would like in most projects to have a fraction of the uh, funds devoted to support for transition, which could either be, as these bullets say, some kind of end user acceptance, tours, uh, uh, you know, public days or something, and then finally maybe a guidance and training module. So here's how the process works. There's really three parallel calls that we're talking about today. There's a call for Depar Department of Defense Laboratories. That's on the left of this slide. There's the broader broad agency announcement call, which is for private sector people. And then there's also a parallel call for federal organizations outside of DOD. As you will see, these are mostly parallel, although Tim will talk about the differences when he gets into the individual details. All three of these calls uh, call for a pre-proposal, which will be submitted in a couple of months, a uh, month and a half, I guess. After the pre-proposal, there is a down select in which pre-proposals that are promising, that look like they match what we're looking for, we invite a full proposal. The full proposal then leads into an oral briefing and then ultimately the selection. The schedule for all this is on the next slide. You can see that this proposal was released in February, 1st of February of this year. The pre-proposals are due on April the 6th. And notice that it's at 2 p.m. Eastern time. We're relatively aggressive about that. So please don't be begging us at 3.15 Eastern time saying you forgot it was not California. Uh, I don't know that any of you that are on this call are also involved in the environmental technologies call, but there's a pair, there's a uh, a same call out for the environmental technologies, but those pre-proposals are due March the 9th, so please don't mix those dates up. Uh, environmental technologies on March the 9th, installation energy on April 6th. And then as we go down the table, we will ask for full proposals in June of uh, 17, of course. Full proposals will be due about six, eight weeks after that. Briefings before the technical committee will occur in September with project selection in October, which of course is planning to start the contracting process at the beginning of the fiscal year and have the projects kick off in spring of 18. So here's a little detail on each of those three parallel paths we talked about two slides ago. Uh, we have the call for DOD where we are looking to address DOD installation injury requirements. All of the, the uh, next two bullets I've already outlined to you in the uh, slide before, short written pre-proposal, in this case five pages. You'll see the instructions on the website. Uh, when we, if we select this for a full proposal request, we will clearly ask you or tell you what parts that match what we're looking for and what parts don't. So this modification is recommended. This definitely comes into play. And then finally, that would lead to selection if uh, funding is available. The broad agency announcement and the call for proposals for federal organizations outside of DOD are pretty much a parallel process with the exception of the first bullet. Here we are asking only for proposals in specific topic areas, which Tim will get in in a little uh, few minutes, about five slides from now. Then the rest of the process is completely the same, a short and written pre-proposal, same length, same requirements. Those that we accept, we will give feedback on and request a full proposal. We will also help people in this category identify a DOD liaison if required. 
This is a person that can help you identify a site that's likely a good site to demonstrate your topic, help you navigate the DOD approval process, all the things you probably don't know that the DOD people already know. And then as part of that, that would be part of the full proposal process. Then, of course, we move on to selection, which is just the same as the other process. So here are the selection criteria for both uh, full proposals and pre-proposals. Like I said that in the wrong order, pre-proposals and full proposals. So clearly there are two pass-fail gates. Is the technology that is proposed relevant to the call? And please take this seriously. If you find yourself stretching your, your technology to, to uh, meet the call, you're probably not, it's probably not a very wise use of your time. And then the second gate is, is this a technology that is appropriate to, for demonstration? Remember back to about the third slide, mature commercial technologies are really not appropriate for demonstration, as are, neither are uh, technologies that are not yet proven in the lab. And then after one passes those two gates, we go to the other uh, uh, potential selection criteria. Technical merit is clearly the most important of these. Then comes cost benefit, the transition proposal cost and small business participation if you are a commercial firm. So sometimes we are asked what makes a competitive proposal, and of course the short answer is a real cool technology that can save a lot of money. But the uh, less shorthand answer is, and I've said this once already, clearly address a topic area. If you find yourself really stretching your technology to meet a topic area, you're less likely by far to be successful in your proposal, uh, your pre-proposal, excuse me. Well-defined demonstration questions. I said earlier that this is definitely a technology question. Pretty pictures and nice graphics are a nice thing to have at the end, but we really want to have well-defined questions, what we're going to measure, what do we expect the outcomes to be, and can we put down a hard descriptor of what will be success and what will be failure. And then we obviously are looking for technology to provide a significant benefit and either improve performance or reduce cost. And obviously, uh, finally, it has to be a technically sound technology. Uh, we're really not looking for pie in the sky things. We need a detailed technology description, well-defined performance objectives. We just ask those the two bullets above it. And then, of course, a very detailed technical approach. So now I'd like to hand, hand the uh, microphone over to my colleague, Timothy Troll, who is going to talk to you in detail about the particular topics of this year's call. All right, thank you, Herb. Uh, I want to apologize in advance. I'm just getting over cold, so you might hear me clearing my throat occasionally. Um, so like Herb said, uh, he provided an overview of, of uh, uh, CERP and ESTCP in our process. I'm going to start off with a, a little more details about the energy and water program area and then go into uh, a description of our uh, topics for this solicitation. So as with all the other program areas, um, <clears throat> excuse me, we use uh, um, our uh, military installations as uh, test beds for, uh, for innovative uh, energy and water technologies. And the objectives obviously are to, uh, to validate the cost and performance um, uh, of those technologies. Um, also, just like the other programs, uh, an emphasis on, on uh, transferring those technologies to the end user. For energy and water, we also um, work, uh, uh, collaborate with, uh, with DOE and look to um, leverage past investments from DOE as well as our own investments uh, in previous ESTCP projects. So the, the categories of, uh, for energy and water that, uh, that we fund uh, are kind of categorized in three areas. There's, um, uh, well, we'll go into that in more detail, but the we cover energy efficiency, renewable energy, uh, microgrids, uh, as well as uh, emphasis on um, energy security as well. So it's not just an element of energy savings, but also we're uh, looking toward uh, improving energy security uh, at our installations. So the uh, installation energy is the focus of, of our uh, program. Uh, you can see here the uh, in FY15 uh, DOD uh, spent uh, just over, over or just under 17 billion um, in uh, energy costs. The majority of that is for operational energy. Our program focuses on facility energy, uh, which is about a quarter of, of that total cost. And you can see on the right, this is a breakdown uh, of uh, our end use fuels um, by category. 
So our, uh, the Energy and Water Program area focuses on, on three main categories. We cut a, cover a broad array of technologies, and we organize them into three groups. There's a smart and secure installation energy management, which would include microgrids, energy storage, ancillary service market participation, and cybersecurity. Uh, the next is efficient integrated buildings. Uh, that covers a, uh, a broad array of technologies, including advanced components, uh, uh, decision support tools, tools to, to assist in, uh, in design and retrofit and operation of facilities, uh, and intelligent building management. And then the third category is, is uh, distributed generation uh, that includes renewables, combined heat and power, uh, and uh, waste heat recovery, typically. And I, so the, we have three uh, topics in this year's solicitation, two of which are, uh, are, are eligible for uh, all three uh, audiences. Uh, and uh, that includes uh, DOD, federal agencies, organizations outside of DOD, and, the, and a broad agency uh, announcement call. So the, um, the first uh, uh, topic here is, um, is uh, included in all, all of the other program areas uh, and is also available to uh, all three audience groups. And it's innovative technology transfer approaches. So this, uh, like I mentioned, is available to all program areas. It was issued actually uh, in the earlier uh, solicitation with the environmental uh, program areas. And we're looking, uh, we're looking for, tech, for technology transfer approaches that uh, uh, can target an individual technology or provide solutions that uh, uh, in, impact the tech transfer uh, of all of our technologies more broadly uh, across different program areas. We uh, also um, would like to encourage DOD organizations to look at this topic uh, area as they have um, a great perspective, we think, in uh, and how technologies get to their end users. I also want to call out that uh, we issued a, a solicitation in FY15 um, that was similar, and there is a link uh, in the topic. If you, if you go to the uh, read through the topic, there's a link within that uh, PDF that will take you to a list of uh, projects that were funded in, in FY15 that will give you a good idea of uh, the, uh, the um, technologies and, and solutions that we funded, uh, and it would help you avoid duplication and also give you an opportunity to possibly build upon what was already uh, what we already funded uh, in this topic area. So the next topic also is open to all audiences, and this is uh, innovative approaches to obtaining authority to operate for facility-related re control systems. The objective of this uh, topic is to reduce the time and cost of obtaining an ATO for net network-reliant facility energy control systems. We are looking for um, technologies that um, have a high likelihood of to receiving, achieving reciprocity between services as a way to uh, um, as a way to accelerate the uh, achievement of these ATOs for typical technologies that are currently installed in installations or technologies that are, are new technologies that, that uh, will be installed uh, taking advantage of some of these advanced uh, interconnected technologies for energy and water uh, efficiency. Next slide. So this last uh, topic is uh, specific to BAA only, uh, and it is uh, for energy efficiency technology demonstrations that are integrated with utility energy services contracts. The objective here is to uh, assist in accelerating the tech transfer of, of technologies by getting them in the hands of, uh, of, of uh, integrators like utilities uh, and using the implementation mechanisms of UESCs that are commonly used for uh, deploying technologies like this. So we are looking for technologies that uh, would not uh, otherwise be included in a UESC um, and uh, that also have a high likelihood of adoption 
to be included in UESC projects um, after the demonstration. Also, project leads in this case should be utilities that are planning um, uh, or developing UESCs on military installations. Um, we encourage them to collaborate with, uh, with the installations that they're working with. They're also technology developers um, to come up with or present uh, innovative uh, technologies to be, to be demonstrated. Also, the, uh, one of the objectives here is that we have the technology, uh, the demonstration to be integrated with the UESC contract, and so uh, it, can, um, it, can be, it can be supported with O&M after the end of the demonstration period uh, through the UESC uh, contract. And for more information on, on these uh, topics, you can go to our website, uh, and I would imagine you've been there to, to review them already, but uh, if you uh, go to the website, there's, you can read through these uh, topics in more detail. Okay, thank you, Tim. We have had a number of questions. We will answer as many questions as time permits focusing on those that are generally applicable to all submitters or logistical in nature. Please note that we will not be able to answer questions about specific proposal ideas or technologies during this webinar. So, What are the typical funding levels for ESTCP demonstration projects? For energy and water, we have, like, because we have a wide array of technologies uh, within our portfolio, uh, we have kind of a broad range of, of funding levels um, as well. So, in uh, tough to define typical, but I'd say a range would be uh, between 200K and in some cases up to uh, 4 million, uh, like I said, depending on funding, but also the complexity of the, of the technology and the demonstration but there is no limit. How are funds provided to non-federal partners on DOD-led proposals? The, in general, the answer to that is through the DOD lead. In almost all cases, the DOD lead or their laboratory or installation will uh, uh, initiate a contract action with the non-DOD performer. Is there a typical length for ESTCP demonstrations? There is not typical length, but uh, the for for um, uh, for BAA the the contract term is is limited to five years, but the typical length I would say is is closer to the two to three range. Can multiple proposals be submitted by the same organization? Yes, we can receive. We're happy to receive multiple proposals from the same organization. Obviously, though, there will become a point where fatigue on the point of the pre-proposal reviewer sets in. So if you think you have 15 or 20 ideas, maybe you should whittle that down a little bit. But it's not at all uh, uncommon to get two or maybe three proposals from one organization. How do you anticipate calculating the energy savings from obtaining an ATO for a technology or technology type? And how is the energy savings potential weighted in the proposal evaluation? So for the, uh, the uh, ATO topic, um, the, the objective there is to reduce the time and cost associated with it, obtaining an ATO. And the, 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 um, the cost of obtaining an ATO is a component of the life cycle cost for energy projects and can sometimes be the difference between a project being life cycle cost effective or not. In some cases, it may be difficult to calculate the direct energy savings related to a proposed technology, but we ask that proposals at least provide an explanation of how the technology will benefit DOD installations in terms of energy and water cost savings. And cost benefit being one of the evaluation criteria uh, we talked about earlier, uh, you can review the instructions on the pre-proposal uh, submission uh, to learn more about how those um, criteria are, are evaluated. Is there a page limit associated with the pre-proposal? Yes, there's a very strictly uh, uh, enforced page limit. You should, before submitting a pre-proposal, everyone should look on the website and download the 
proposal submission instructions. The answer to the specific answer to the question is there. It's a five-page limit, but there is also a provision for data attachments in the appendices. So please take a look at the uh, instructions before you submit a brief proposal. Are proposals that integrated energy efficiency technology demonstrations with energy savings performance contracts, ESPCs, eligible under this solicitation? Yes, they are. However, uh, the proposal should explain how the demonstration technology will be integrated with the ESPC while adhering to the ESPC statutory requirements. Uh, the ESTCP program office uh, is not discouraging proposals that integrate demonstration projects with ESPCs, but we found that the statutory requirements present a more challenging approach to meeting the objectives of this topic as compared to UESCs. Could you please define mature technology? Well, uh, I'll give you the ESCCP definition of mature technology, but I'm not so sure that it's the uh, completely the dictionary definition. And I'll go back to some of the slides I used earlier. If you are not, if you do not have in hand good cost and performance data such that someone could sit down and inspect this technology and, uh, for an application and expect to know what it's going to cost and expect to know how it's going to perform, that's not a mature, that's a, a technology that is ready for demonstration validation but not too mature. If you are a commercially available technology, that is ready to go into the marketplace, then that is probably too mature for an ESTCB demonstration. What stage of development would a project be considered? For example, pre-preliminary assessment, post-PA, pre-IGA, et cetera. So what we are looking for is for a, pro a, a UESC, or, or in this case possibly ESPC project, to be at a stage where uh, the, the uh, combined efforts in um, energy auditing, data collection, and design, and implementation, implementation can be leveraged. So um, if, it's, if it's past the IGA, I think it's probably difficult to benefit from those uh, common efforts. Uh, if it's too early in acquisition planning, uh, the likelihood or the confidence level in a project actually moving forward may be lower. So it's, it's within that range, um, but primarily we're focused on being able to leverage uh, those common efforts to reduce the cost of the demonstration project and gain uh, the benefits from uh, the contractor's knowledge of the installation. Do BAA organizations need a DOD lead before submitting a pre-proposal? No, no, not at all. And that, in fact, is the point of the DOD liaison that, can, that will be appointed if you uh, get, go on to the full proposal stage. Many of our projects are completely private sector run and only interface with the DOD at the demonstration site, so no need for a DOD lead. Can an existing UESC participate, or does it have to be a new UESC contract? So the... Back to the objectives, we want to uh, have the demonstration project be integrated with the UESC contract so that there is uh, provided uh, ongoing O&M support potentially, either through uh, a service agreement or through uh, training offered to the installation themselves to maintain and operate the technology uh, beyond the end of the contract, so of the demonstration project. So. Uh, whether there, you can get that done through an existing contract, um, that, that's great. We, we will leave it open. So it doesn't need to be new, but um, we are open to any uh, proposals that would allow for uh, those objectives. Can a current ESTCP contractor apply for another project with a new PI? Yes, absolutely. We have a number of our uh, contractor firms that have one or more um, ESCCP projects, mostly with, obviously, as you suggest in this question, a separate PI because many of these are nearly full-time jobs, but uh, we're, we're happy to consider that. Are ESPCs allowed in Texas? The, I, I think the question may have been, are UESCs allowed in Texas? Um, um, I would refer you to the Federal Energy Management Program, FEMP, website. They have a great resource there, and there's a link uh, in the topic at the bottom of the topic uh, PDF 
uh, that provide you a link to that website and they can give you some information. Will feedback be provided on pre-proposals that are not selected? No, in general we do not are not able to provide feedback on not selected pre-proposals. We get quite a volume of these and we don't have the staff to support that. Could a DOD employee be the PI on an ESTCP funded project but the technology being demonstrated has been developed outside of the DOD? Yes, that is actually quite common. Does a demonstration site need to be identified in the pre-proposal? No, we don't need a, a, a description of the exact demonstration site in the pre-proposal, but I think it would be wise to spend a paragraph or a two, excuse me, describing what the ideal site would look like. That will make it much easier to hook you up with a DOD liaison if required when we get to the full proposal stage. Is it critical for a technology developing partner to talk to a UESC project lead before submitting a pre-proposal under this topic area? It is, it is uh, highly recommended that a UESC project at least be identified. Whether or not the uh, UESC contractor themselves, the utility, uh, has um, been uh, provided a letter of commitment. Uh, I don't think that's necessary, but at least needs to, we need to identify that there is a UESC uh, being contemplated or in development at the installation that you are uh, citing. Can a DOD organization submit a proposal that responds to a BAA topic? Yes, absolutely. You will notice, I think, that the DOD call is in general broader than the specific BAA topic, so that uh, using that logic, you would find that the BA topics are considered part of the DOD call. Why have you limited the UESC opportunity to UESCs only? So this uh, is a question that um, uh, is, is answered because we have the, the challenges with, with integrating a uh, demonstration project with a UESC or ESPC uh, is the basis of, of why we selected UESCs. We found that there are uh, likely fewer uh, barriers to integrating a demonstration project with the UESC, so we were focusing on that, although we are um, open to proposals that would include a demonstration project with an ESPC. However, uh, that uh, proposal would need to uh, explain how the demonstration project will be integrated with the ESPC and also following the statutes for, uh, for ESP ESPCs. Can proposals submitted in previous years but not funded be submitted again this year? Well, in theory, there's no prohibition against that, though, against that. But if you, one notices carefully, particularly BA and the BAA side, the topics are quite limited and it would not be very likely that a proposal that matched last year's topic would match this year's topic. If in some uh, sense I'm incorrect about that, then yes, you can submit the proposal, but be very careful about, remember that one of the very first things is relevance, very first gates is relevance to the topic. The presentation mentioned cybersecurity. There are generally no savings in connection with cybersecurity technologies. How would something like this be considered? So the, the objective is to, like I said, reduce the, the time and cost associated with gaining an ATO. Uh, currently, uh, there are many technologies uh, installed on, on DOD installations that um, were intended to have uh, network connectivity in order to generate their, uh, their benefits to the, to the installation. Because they are not connected, they're not able to operate as originally intended, and so there is an opportunity lost in uh, energy savings or operational efficiency uh, that um, gaining an ATO would, uh, would alleviate. So cybersecurity technology itself does not generate energy savings, but it facilitates energy savings by allowing these new innovative energy technologies to uh, perform as originally intended through uh, network connectivity. Is cost sharing a requirement for ESTCP projects? 
No, cost sharing is not a requirement, although the extent of cost sharing is obviously looked favorably on by the committee that makes a decision. So it, it is not an absolute requirement, but is a positive. Yeah. Can a project qualify for funding from both this program and EFFECT? Yes, uh, we have. Um, uh, in the past, uh, combined uh, funding from other programs as long as the objectives of this demonstration are met uh, and the funding is clearly identified uh, for uh, uh, the work to be done, conducted under the demonstration. What is the total funding under, available under this program for all projects? So that's a difficult question to answer in absolute terms. It depends on three things. The total level of funding uh, received by ESCCP in fiscal 18. We know what the President's budget request might be, but we certainly don't know what will be the outcome of the budget process. How many of our current projects are still going on in this area and how well they're progressing and what their funding requirements are, so the, what we call the tails, uh, the ongoing tails. And then what would be the distribution among the program areas in ESCCP? So now that's a way of saying you're never going to figure that out. But the real answer would be new starts or some five million-ish sort of number for new starts, I would think, would be the plan in F if FY18. How can a technology developer learn more about UESCs? So uh, I mentioned earlier the uh, DOE's Federal Energy Management Program uh, has a great resource uh, does, uh, on UESCs, uh, and uh, there is a link on the uh, topic on the PDF that will take you to their website that provides uh, lots of background and also gives you information about utilities that currently offer UESCs in their regions. Can foreign organizations submit proposals to ESTCP? Uh, yes, it is. It is not. Uh, it is not rare at all for us to have foreign organizations involved in ESTCP projects, both foreign government organizations and, and private sector companies uh, based in, outside of the United States. The only issue might come up on some basis, access to, to some parts of some basis might be restricted. So we'd have to work hard at finding the, pro, uh, finding the demonstration site to make that all work. Why have you limited energy savings demonstration opportunities to either ESPCs and UESCs, both of these forms of contracts, simply favor large companies versus smaller technology companies? So the, um, the, the solicitation is not um, limited to ESCOs or utilities uh, or technologies that are developed within those companies. So the technology developers are encouraged to uh, reach out to ESCOs uh, and utilities and present their technologies, encourage them to, uh, or, or uh, ask for their partner in, in submitting a proposal. The, reasons, the reason why we're, uh, we've identified UESCs and ESPCs as, as a way to implement is only because those are very common methods for uh, getting uh, projects implemented, and we're trying to encourage th these mechanisms to include new, more uh, advanced technologies. The technology themselves are still open to any small companies that have innovative technologies. How many new start projects will be funded in FY18? Okay, so that is one that's impossible to answer. So I spoke earlier about the amount of money that would be available, and we came to something in the four or five million dollar range for new starts. But as Tim told you earlier in the answer to one of the questions, the, the uh, cost range of these projects, the yearly cost range of these projects, varies pretty widely. So the process is the uh, ESCCP Technical Committee ranks the projects in order of priority, and then we fund as many as we can with the available resources. If it happened to be a number of small projects, then the number would obviously be larger. If it's just one or five or uh, three very large projects, then the number would be quite small. For the past two years, there has not been a distributed ener energy efficiency topic. Will there be a distributed energy efficiency ESTCP topic in the future? 
So it's difficult to tell uh, what uh, our future plans hold. Right now, uh, we have um, uh, we basically d develop our t our topics throughout the year. It is it is possible. It's not that we um, feel that distributed energy is not uh, an opportunity. It's just not as critical right now uh, in our uh, um, uh, mission space. Can topics that are part of BAA be addressed by federal organizations through their submissions? Yeah, so that is actually a very close to a question I answered just a few minutes ago. We probably had some overlap in the electrons during that. Uh, as you will, I think, notice, the BAA topics tend to be narrower, more tightly focused than do the federal call for, for, for a proposal. So I think in all cases, the BAA topics are subsets, and so uh, DOD people can propose against those same topics. Will Sport Wachuca, who oversees and implements these standards, be involved to gain an understanding of what is currently done and how to streamline this process? So uh, we have uh, a lot of information on our website. Uh, if you uh, re re read through the topic, we, we also cite in there uh, on our website a list of guides, uh, standards, and uh, processes that uh, are currently, uh, I guess the, the current uh, guidance from DOD on uh, the, the ATO process. So uh, I would start there. Uh, we have not identified um, uh, any, anybody uh, specific to oversee um, the, this process. Uh, we're just going to base um, our uh, guidance on what we currently have on our website. Do projects at National Guard facilities quali qualify under this program? Yes, they do. This is the last more general question that we have received. There are other questions which are more specific to a topic area or technology. For those questions, we ask that you contact Tim Tatro directly using the information located at the end of the topic. Thank you for attending the webinar today. As a reminder, the presentation and audio will be archived for future reference on the ESTCP solicitation webpage. This concludes today's webcast.